of the things that's just mind boggling to me. I see these, you know, these people come to these big positions of yeah. power with these big companies with these, you know, eight, nine, ten figures in ad for assets or more, yeah. and they're. You, they're idiots, and they're 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 presented to the average American person is like, oh, they're the CEO. They they have this special skill, and there's this oracle. How do they just? Are they just rich kids? Their dad just puts them in these positions. Like, how do they? How's this guy who's so dumb has a, a business model that's failing? Yeah. How does he get into this position? Well, in the finance industry, the the relationship between the, the Federal Reserve Bank and Wall Street and the finance industry is one of mutual destruction, where in order for the Fed to get away with counterfeiting money, which they do, they issue trillions of unbacked claims that they call dollars, but there's nothing backing any of the multi-trillion dollars that they claim are in existence, the US mm -hmm. dollars. There's literally nothing backing, the, which is a joke because people say, well, there's nothing backing Bitcoin, but that's false. But then, then they'll say, what about the, the, the government backs the dollar? But that's also false. There's nothing backing the dollar. But so they have all these uh, trillions of, so to get the, the distribution of those worthless paper claims called US dollars requires an infrastructure of crooks. And so on Wall Street, you have like the primary dealers. There's 18, I believe, primary dealers. There might be more now. They are in charge of doing distribution with the Federal Reserve Bank into the Wall Street system, into the financial system. And that goes to places like, um, you know, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and the big bulge bracket firms who then take in, in all this money and then they are distributing it down to their broker dealer network who's then creating products uh, like um, financial products that they're, they manufacture like sausage, right? Financial products are manufactured like any manufactured product. And some of them suck. Some of them are lemons. Some of them don't work. Like one of the first ETFs that came out was a Bitcoin futures ETF. It wasn't a spot ETF. And the big, a Bitcoin futures ETF, by, by definition, is a horrible product. It can never, ever work because the carry on a futures contract rolling it forward is always going to be greater than any potential profit you're going to make in a basket of futures contracts. And that's a known fact. And that's, um, but nevertheless, it got approved because it's it's used as um, a slush fund. So a lot of these products are used to dump bad trades, to dump losing trades, to dump risk. Risk is packaged uh, and it's dumped into products and those products are then dumped into pension funds. That's like how a lot of this, that's why pension funds are always underperforming. They like the firemen and teachers are like, you know, it's under it's underperforming, it's underfunded because Wall Street uses it as a toxic waste dump. They take the risk that they separate from a product that they sold to their friends in the Hamptons and they repackage it as a derivative. And then they dump that derivative in a pension fund and then it goes down in value. And then they're like, we don't know, we, how, do, how would we know that it was going to go down in value? Well, you just, you just put rat poison into their stew and they're dying. So I think it was a good guess that it was a bad guess. So when you have like people get the jobs at these, some of these financial firms because they're essentially they're crooked or they're stupid. And so certainly the pension fund manager industry is rife with stupid people. That's how they get the job. There was a great, uh, in, in Orange County, California, this goes back more than 20 years now, a guy named Robert Citrone was, was, a fine, was, was caught. You know, he, he was caught being a stooge for Wall Street and just taking obvious garbage into the fund and losing it all. And so that became a bit of a scandal for a short period of time. But that's really not the exception to the rule. That's the rule. Everybody does the exact same thing. And pension fund managers, particularly for the public pension funds, are put in those places because they're corrupt, they're venal, they're, they're morons. That's their job is to just take whatever Wall Street sells them, and don't ask any questions, and then uh, that's what they do. And that's why a lot of people have horrible performance in these pension funds. And it's another way to attack the working class, the, the, pen, the teachers and the firemen and the policemen, the yeah. public sector who have these large public pension funds, you know, they're constantly being attacked. This is another way to attack them, is to bankrupt them in their pension account by letting Wall Street use it as a dump for risk, a risk dump. Why? You know, let me give you a little bit more of historical context here. Back in the 70s and the early 80s, you had the creation of what was called the option pricing volatility formula. 
So the option pricing volatility formula was the beginning of listed options in Chicago. And this is the beginning of the derivatives industry. And what the derivatives industry does is it separates reward from risk the same way that atomic physicists separate matter from energy, right? If you separate matter from energy, you get an atomic bomb. With the vol uh, options volatility options formula, you separate risk from reward and the two can be traded separately. You can separate the risk from an asset. This is like a credit default swap, which is essentially the way a corporation can bundle the risk of their bonds and sell it separately on to someone willing to take on that risk from them. And they're left with just the bond. This is a very crude explanation, but it nevertheless gets the point across that you are taking a stock or a bond or a basic component of the capitalist system and you're slicing and dicing it in ways that um, separate the risk from reward. So you very, why do the top one tenth of 1% keep getting richer and everyone else is getting poorer? Because the top one tenth of 1% is, is gifted the reward part of the system and everyone else ends up with the risk part of the system, right? So, um, oh, you know, why is Nancy Pelosi making hundreds of millions of dollars? Yeah. Because she's trading on inside information and also she trades in the options market and she's doing so in ways that as a former options trader myself, and I was like the, one of the biggest options producers in the entire Sheriff's and Lehman Hutton system in 1988, 1989. That means I was trading a fuck ton of options because it's a 10,000 broker system. And I was like one of the biggest options producers. I'm very familiar with the listed options market and Nancy Pelosi is engaged in massive fraud. Hillary Clinton, when she and the governor Clinton were starting out in Arkansas, they started with a $100,000 uh, war chest to start Bill's career as governor. Where did that $100,000 come from? Well, we know that it came from Hillary Clinton working with a agricultural futures trader in the Midwest, I guess in Chicago, was she gave him $1,000, he turned it into $100,000 in a matter of a few months by just doing crooked insider trades for the entire time. And that was, and then he spun it back to Hillary and that that's how they got their career started. So that they're very familiar with financial fraud because their, their entire careers are, are based on financial fraud. The f committing financial fraud is incredibly easy. The, the shitcoin market, people say, oh, you know, the shitcoin market is incredibly fraudulent and there's like 20,000 of them yeah. and everyone involved is crooked and it's obvious, but it mimics the financial system at large is exactly the same, except it's just done more discreetly. It's done with nicer suits right? and it's done um, in a way that CNBC and Jim Cramer talk about it with legitimacy as if there's legitimacy to this stuff, but they're, they're engaged in essentially the same kind of crooked financial manipulation, which as you get into an economy that's more and more based on fiat money, it gets easier and easier and easier mm -hmm. to commit fraud. Now what's happened in, in the last couple of years is that the cost of committing financial fraud was always getting cheaper because interest rates are always going down for 40 years. But in, start, in February of 2022, when Russia invades Ukraine, you know, Russia, why did they do that? Well, one of the reasons they did that is that they felt comfortable that they could essentially put the knife into the dollar um, for good. And that they're the biggest commodity producer in the world. And all commodities are priced in dollars as a result of the uh, World War II, uh, post-World War II, um, um, you know, financial mm -hmm. arrangement that was made, Brenton Woods agreement. And so they were not getting the most that they could for their commodities. So uh, one of the calculated risks that was taken by Russia when they cross over into Ukraine is that the backlash would be that they would face a lot of sanctions. But they did the calculation and figured that, well, okay, we can we can take the hit on sanctions because we know, as Putin said to Tucker Carlson, um, before, you know, just a few years ago, eight, more than 80% of all Russian trade was in US dollars. Now it's 13%. It's all with the BRICS. It's with the Chinese Yuan and, wow. and, and other BRIC nations. So and, be, and so they're getting more for their commodities on a net basis than they were now that they're outside of the dollar. So it's all very calculated. It, and, and Putin said this in the Tucker Carlson interview, if you, if you listen to his 
what he says, I mean, it's all very pragmatic. Like they, they're not driven by emotion. They're not, they're just like, they just went through the spreadsheet and they're like, well, you know, we, we, they, we've been told for 20 years from NATO that they wouldn't push East. They keep pushing East. And then they did a coup in 2014 yeah. in Ukraine. And, <laughs> and now, you know, they seem to, that doesn't seem to be enough. They, they keep harassing us. They keep building these military bases surrounding us. So, okay, what, let's figure this out. If I can move into Ukraine and they put the sanctions on and then they move to the dollar and click, tick, 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 tick. oh, we actually make money. It's accretive. It's accretive. Their economy is growing. It's the biggest economy in Europe. And it's not, it's not, it's not going, they're growing. Russia, this was a power play by Russia to grow their economy and it is growing. And it's all very calculated. If you want to know why, just listen to what Putin says to Tucker Carlson. He just lays it out in a very no nonsense point by bullet point pitch deck, <laughs> right? If he was a venture capitalist, you would give him $20 trillion to do what he did because it makes perfect economic sense, right? And there's, there's no end game for Ukraine or NATO. There's no end game. They have no, they're, they're like BitBoy. They're losing money or Jeremy Allaire. They're losing money on every trade. Every single weapon they sell, they, they lose money. In, in, in aggregate dollar purchasing power because Russia is now running the show on the producer prices. So your dollar is losing purchasing power. Yeah. You know, your dollar in inflation is real. You know, McDonald's Happy Meal is like 20 bucks. You know, uh, co cocoa prices are at 50 year highs. The, the whole goal of America and the, the, the war machine is to just more war. It's not about winning wars or, or, or stopping some sort of injustice. It's just like, just keep spending endless money on war. And again, it sounds like just as corrupt as the financial system with no real end game in sight. There's no, no. like, look at Afghanistan. We spent $3.5 trillion over 20 years for presidents from both political parties. And what did we accomplish? We replaced the Taliban with the Taliban. Okay, so um, in Hollywood, you uh, you're you're uh, you make a movie that cost um, fifty million, hundred million, two hundred million dollars. Why you know one of the reasons why the budgets are big, so huge in Hollywood is that the the fees that are paid out to producers are a percentage of budget. So the bigger the budget, the bigger your fee, right? So the the movie can bomb and not make any money at all but you made a big fee because your fee is tied to budget. It's not tied to box office performance, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, in the war game, the war industry, the bigger the war, the bigger your fee. So you want the biggest possible war you can start because you get the biggest fee. And since you're dealing with taxpayer bucks and the federal budget and the money printers, the Federal Reserve, the, the way that you get away with it for 40 years is that interest rates have been going down for 40 years. So no matter how much money you lose, you can always sell more bonds to pay for it. That's how America's now got a $33 right. trillion dollars in debt because for the last 40 years, they've been building up, they just keep selling more debt and the world's been buying that debt. And if you don't buy our debt, we come and kill you. Ask Saddam Hussein, yeah. <laughs> ask, uh, you know, Gaddafi, uh, Gaddafi right? right? He wanted to sell oil and something other than dollars. Bye. Dead, uh, <laughs> Saddam Hussein. Oh, he wanted to sell oil and euros. Goodbye. Um, right. So that was our foreign policy. That's that's what backs the dollar. As Paul Krugman has said, he said, "What he would ask? What backs the U.S. dollar?" He said, "Men with guns." Yeah. Okay. So now, um, so for forty years, you had this ability to have no accountability whatsoever and just start the biggest war you possibly could and get the fees. But starting in twenty twenty two, in February of twenty twenty two. Uh, that bull market and bonds ended, and now the chickens are coming home to roost. Now, purchasing power for the dollar is going to continue to go down on a multi-year basis on a secular bear market for bonds. And okay, enter Bitcoin. So if you are looking to protect yourself against this inflation problem that's only going to get worse, you would buy Bitcoin. If you want to protect yourself against a, a growing mood in Washington to confiscate your shit. You know, they, Bitcoin is unconfiscatable, right? It, it has, uh, if, 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 if your stock, if your bond products are not being bought, 
your bond ETFs are, are not attractive. Well, launch some Bitcoin ETFs. Well, say, so BlackRock, the biggest ETF producer in the world, they look at their bond ETFs and they're like, they had the worst year in de- you know 20 years. And everyone's puking out their bond ETFs. And aside from seven stocks that are making new highs, the internal dynamics of the stock market are quite weak, actually. What's, what's called breadth, which are the number of stocks making new highs, mm-hmm. is collapsing. But the price of those seven wonder stocks like Apple and uh, uh, Amazon and, and Google, mm-hmm. right? And uh, NVDA, NVIDIA, NVIDIA, yeah, 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 yeah. right? That, that's like on parabolic, right? Well, if you strip out those seven stocks, you know, the market's actually doesn't look very good at all. So, um, so Wall Street, you know, is going to survive and they're doing Bitcoin ETFs because they see that this is going to have to take the place of definitely the bond ETF market. It looks like junk. And um, so they they're, they're moving into in, into that into that area. So um, you know the, to, to wrap it all up, the, you know the shit coiners are on one hand deplorables, but on the other hand they're just mimicking the system that right. they grew up in. Right? Bitboy is Jim Jim Cramer. <laughs> Essentially, there's no difference between Bitcoin and Jim Cramer. Well, I mean Jim Cramer doesn't have a hip sack. A fanny pack and a stripper in his car, but yeah, yeah, I see your point. Sure. I see your point. He's the Jim Cramer of shitcoins, <laughs> bit boy, right? And uh, but they, they do the same thing. Jim Jim Cramer, if you if you were to buy and sell everything he's told you oh. for the last ten years, you would be absolutely nowhere. He would be at zero. He's he doesn't make his performances. You would net out at zero. You know, they doesn't that in the aggregate. He doesn't really give you anything to bank on. He's just he's just a, a clown. Essentially, like BitBoy. BitBoy and Jim Cramer are cut from the same cloth. They're just different generations. Jim Cramer is part of the the old school legacy stock market shitcoinery, right. and BitBoy is the new crypto shitcoinery. But they do the exact same thing, uh, and th- they're no different in that sense. <laughs>